Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dan Sweet, and I'm with Vertical Aviation International. Uh, obviously, we've had some changes since uh, we did our last webinar back in the days of Helicopter Association International. So welcome to VAI at Work webinars. We're glad you're able to join us today. Um, if you want more information about our rebranding, there's information out and about in plenty of places. Um, but we're not going to get to, too far in depth on that today. What we are going to talk about today is um, Tim Hunter. Uh, for those of you who did not be able to attend Heli Expo or haven't seen the latest issue of Rotor Magazine, um, Tim is Tim was and is a tour pilot in Hawaii, and encountered one of the most unbelievable situations that I've heard about in aviation, and he's now going to be joining us to uh, share his story. So. Um, let's go ahead and uh, tell you a little bit more about Tim. Um, Tim was uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, and once he uh, finished up his Marine Corps training, he attended a, um, a college professional pilot program at Palm Beach. Well, actually, he's, he's gone to a couple different flight schools and got his commercial instrument rated uh, rotorcraft pilot's license. Um, strangely, a little bit strangely, he's also worked as a uh, ship captain and a heavy equipment operator. Uh, following his school, he uh, flew a Sikorsky S-61 fighting fires. He's also done utility patrol, long line missions, and heli logging. And he has more than 8,000 hours of helicopter flight experience. Uh, right now, he is also the Paradise Helicopter uh, Safety Officer. Paradise Helicopters is located in Hawaii, and he's also a line pilot. And he's recently gone back to work as the uh, safety officer following uh, the accident that he had, and works continually uh, working uh, the flight line uh, and as a safety officer uh, for Paradise. If this is uh, your first time with one of our webinars, our webinars are interactive. We do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, Zoom has a great question module. Uh, please use that question module. Feel free to chat amongst yourselves in the chat function, but uh, the question module, since we have to pick one or the other, we try to stick with just the question module so that following Tim's presentation, you'll be able to uh, uh, ask questions. And we'll go through all the questions at the end of the, uh, the webinar today. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will make it available on our YouTube channel and our website as soon as possible. Usually it takes about 24 hours for things to get rendered and posted, but it will be up. So if you wanna watch something again, or if you wanna share it with somebody else uh, so you can get them to hear Tim's story, that's great as well. We do appreciate it. So now uh, without uh, getting too much further into it, let's uh, go ahead and bring Tim back on or bring Tim on. Tim, please uh, turn on your camera. There we go. Tim, I'm sorry I missed your presentation at uh, the safety symposium at yeah. Heli Expo. Was that your first time at Heli Expo? It, it was my first time uh, at any of the Heli Expos, and uh, it was my uh, second year uh, with uh, joining up with HAI. Oh, nice. Um, what, what did you think of the show? Hey. Well, it's it's it, it was pretty overwhelming. Uh, it's a lot to see and a lot to take in, and then you know, as as a pilot, there is just so much there to learn and network and as a safety officer for Paradise Helicopters, um, it was a great place for me to get some resources on new SMS uh, procedures and and different things that I can uh, you know help with the company you know and ultimately being safety um, based and also saving them some money through insurance by you know having a a really good SMS in place. Oh, nice. Okay, well, um, I'm going to turn my camera off here in just a second. I'm I'm going to start showing some photos. Tim's provided me a bunch of photos from throughout his career, from uh, different parts of uh, his story. And so I'm gonna be uh, just sliding through some of those as Tim speaks. And then like I said, once Tim finishes his presentation, we will uh, uh, take questions. So Tim, I'll let uh, let you take it away. All right, well, hey guys, again, uh, thank you, uh, aloha and mahalo for attending this uh, VAA webinar. My name is Tim Hunter, and this is my survival story. Back on uh, May 12th of 2022, my girlfriend, Caitlin, and I arrived uh, on the Big Island. I had just moved back from California with a plan to work at Paradise Helicopters, 
as a line pilot and for Caitlin to attend Mauna Loa helicopters continuing her flight training. So in the future, we could both uh, be uh, pilots out here in Hawaii working with Paradise and hopefully in just a few years. Then after that, we slowly wanted to settle into uh, purchasing a home and consider starting a family out here in Hawaii. Just Tim, a few I'm weeks. Stop uh, you for just, Tim, I'm going to stop you for just a second. I want to make sure that your slides or picture is showing on your screen. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, I got the got pictures it. up. Apologize. Go ahead. Yeah, no worries. Just just a couple of weeks uh, prior to coming out to the Big Island, um, I, I flew out on my own dime uh, to come out and interview with Paradise um, to get the potential job. I ended up meeting with the uh, DO and the chief pilot, um, asking them to bring me on board. Luckily, the day uh, that I did meet them, they offered me a position and they asked me to start as soon as possible. This seemed a pretty natural transition for me because the last two and a half years, I was working with uh, Sacramento executive helicopters flying Bell 407s and long range. The Bell 407 is being Paradise Helicopters' primary machine. Not to mention that I've got uh, about six years of prior flying on all the Hawaiian islands. Hawaii is my backyard. Paradise Helicopters is located right next door to Mauna Loa Helicopters Flight School at the Kona Airport. I've known uh, Mauna Loa Helicopters for quite some time and become friends with the owner. He's been a great source of mentorship and sound advice throughout my flying career. He's just a great guy. Finding housing in Hawaii isn't easy, especially in such a short time frame. And I had committed to Paradise to being back uh, within three weeks or less. The day before I was returned to California, I secured a small studio conveniently located in Kona. It was pretty pricey, but nice, and it came fully furnished had uh, silverware plates and everything. And I had uh, right out back was a beautiful lanai with a hot tub. Everything was lining up pretty right. Caitlin, she sold our RV as I was already, and was already packing our belongings after hearing the news that I got the job. Moving back to Hawaii wasn't an easy task. We shipped two vehicles, my motorcycle, and a container with items like our two huge fat tire mountain bikes, a couple electric one wheels, and many, many other personal belongings. After about two weeks of settling in our new studio and completing my uh, part 135 training and company training, I had my first week of making revenue. This was June 8th, and it was my fifth day of flying revenue. The first flight of that day was a maintenance and return to service flight from a recent engine swap. On board my uh, flight, I brought the uh, mechanic and one of our ground crew. We put about 20 minutes on the hob. I confirmed the engine was performing the specs with the mechanic. Then we returned back to Kona. I, I went off and, and signed it back into return to service. My next two flights were Circle Island experiences. They were about two hours each. Both of these flights went as normal with pretty good weather and visibility. The day was mostly clear with light trade winds, making my routes pretty uh, easy. The last flight on my schedule was a two hour Circle Island sunset tour. We take off about 5 p.m. from Kona and circle the Big Island for an active volcanoes, historic Hilo, the scenic Hamakua Coast, continued on to the North Shore, the Kohala Valleys, where tall waterfalls are plentiful. From here, we head back along breathtaking coastlines as the sun starts to settle off in the horizon, coming to an end with the last rays of sunlight cascading off into the ocean as we prepare to land in Kona. On this flight were five passengers and two groups. One was a father with his two daughters that were twins, and the second was a cheerful brother and sister. The brother and sister had rescheduled from an earlier flight that week that we had to uh, cancel due to weather. They were given a safety brief by the ground crew that I come in and talk with them about our flight. I go over the route and answer any questions uh, that they have. And this is also their last chance for a bathroom break because the tour is nonstop and takes about two hours. We then head out to the helicopter 
where they uh, proceed to get seated and buckled in by the ground crew. And we departed at 5 p.m. to the south following the Kona coast. We're showing off our beautiful blue ocean and touristy downtown. After Kona, we continued south for the coffee belt. Hawaii is the only state in the U.S. that grows coffee. It's typically between 1,500 and 3,000 feet where coffee likes to grow. After the coffee belt, we fly over to historic Captain Cook area. This is about 15 minutes into our flight. From the Captain Cook area, we uh, continue down about 15 miles towards South Point, following the highway and county roads where possible. The terrain below becomes unfriendly reddish brown color made up of razor sharp uh -uh lava fields. Approximately 30 minutes into our flight and five miles from where I had planned to show some of Hawaii's black sandy beaches in the Big Island's rare grand green sand beaches is when I felt and I heard a whoosh. We were flying about 1500 feet AGL and about 120 knots. Without any indication, I heard and felt this whoosh and I got pushed forward hard and fast. It dislodged my headset. The helicopter, it began to yaw uncontrollably. As I pushed the left pedal for help, instead it went to the floor. I knew at this time it was an emergency. I tried to gain control of the helicopter. I adjusted my headset as my outside view was spinning. The blue sky to reddish brown lava field. Literally over and over we went, all the while yawing faster and faster. I couldn't get any sense of our attitude. I glanced inside at the gauges and a caution warning panel, only to notice the amber phatic light had illuminated. The cyclic and collective had become heavy, very heavy for me to manipulate, and the pedals were useless as I attempted to arrest the yaw. My outside view just kept spinning faster and faster. The blue sky and red lava, blue and red is all I can see over and over. I transmitted Mayday, Mayday, Shaka 23, six miles of South Point. As I continued to try to gain control of the aircraft, I'm looking outside in an attempt to gain a uh, get a straight and level, straight and level. I kept filling my thoughts, straight and level, Tim, just get it straight. I then instructed my passengers to brace for a hard landing. This is where I could begin to hear them scream. I made another mayday call, Shaka 23, six miles of South Point. I can't recall if I even let off the transmit trigger telling my passengers to brace again, as I was using all my strength to stay on the controls. The whole time, I could hear them screaming. I thought I lost a drive shaft or something has failed in the tail rotor. I rolled the engine into the throttle position in the idle. That is what my experience and training was telling me. It was more of a reaction than a thought out decision. Outside, all I could see was the blue sky than red colored all over lava field over and over and faster and faster. After impacting, my focus quickly went to get everyone away from the aircraft and to grab the fire extinguisher. We still had about 700 pounds of fuel on board and not knowing the condition of the engine and the fuel tanks, I was concerned about catching fire. I kept repeating, are we on fire? Are we on fire? And get everyone away from the aircraft. I wanted to move, but my body wasn't responding, and my head, I felt heavy. I vaguely remember them extracting the front seat passenger next to me. One of the passengers from the back, the young brother, I believe, he tried freeing me from my seatbelt. He was looking me eye to eye and said, we got to get you out. I kept asking, are we on fire? Is everyone out? He looked me in my eyes and he said, everyone is out but you, and we need to get you out now. As we both looked at my right arm, it didn't look or feel right to me. I still couldn't move much of anything else. He said he'd be right back. 
he came back with a rotor tie down strap and made a sling, keeping my right arm close and still. He then freed me from his seatbelt by cutting my seatbelt and cushioned my air my fall with his body from the aircraft. And keep in mind that right below me was really sharp, jagged rock. And he got down and let me fall on him instead of hitting the ground. The two men that were on board, they didn't haul me about 30 feet away from the helicopter, lifting me by my shoulders and dragging most of my weight as my legs weren't much of help. The father went to the top of a lava patch above us and he was on his cell phone. I believe he was talking with 911. I don't remember a lot after getting loaded into the rescue helicopter. It hurt pretty bad as the paramedics were lifting and turning me to fit in through the door. Once on board the uh, rescue helicopter, I saw a friend of mine that was the pilot in my DO and he was looking back at me. He was crying. The paramedic started talking to me and said he was going to insert an IV for fluids and give me something for the pain. After that, I don't recall much of the flight and following ambulance ride to the Kona ER. I woke up to some familiar faces in the Kona ER. My girlfriend, Caitlin, my DO and chief pilot from Paradise and the director of maintenance were there. I could feel their intense concern. I told my DO, the pilot that flew the rescue chopper, thanks for the bumpy ride, boss, trying to lighten the mood. <laughs> and I could tell, and I remember telling him that I rolled the throttle off before we impacted. The last I remember in the Kona ICU before nodding off was my girlfriend's face. My next memory was being loaded on the EMS plane to be transported to Oahu. Again, the lifting and turning was very painful. This was the last time I got to see Caitlin until five days later. I woke up the next day in the Queens Hospital ICU on June 9th to two doctors and a nurse. To my surprise, they were in personal protection gear, a hazmat suit covered head to foot. They told me one of my passengers on board had tested positive for COVID and that I was in quarantine. I asked them, how are my passengers? They told me, just worry about my injuries right now. This made me believe someone was critically hurt and or potentially died. My thoughts were focused very much on my passengers. Both doctors began examining my injuries through their foggy, clear face shield hood. It was difficult to understand to them due to the gear that they had to wear. They had a, you know, a whole hood on with a clear face shield and a mask underneath that. And they were hard to hear and their masks were fogging up inside. So it was difficult to understand them. The neurologist started off by stating that I had broken my back. He explained that I fractured my L3 and L4 vertebrae and herniated the four discs associated with them. He asked if he could examine me. I said yes, and I asked him if I had any paralysis. He proceeded to move and poke my feet, legs, and toes. I could feel the sensations. We both seemed relieved, and he said he didn't want to perform any kind of surgery on my back, potentially fusing broken vertebrae. He said that surgery was more dangerous on, and risky than uh, just letting it heal on its own. The second surgeon in the room was my orthopedic doctor. He explained to tell me that I had fractured my sacrum, my right humerus, and 13 ribs. I had six broken ribs on my right side and seven on my left, and that my right humerus had a spiral fracture. There was four cracks from my shoulder to my elbow, most likely caused from the uh, shock of me being on the controls, fighting them so hard when we impacted. He said to fix the broken arm that I had two choices. The first was to uh, set it kind of old school that it would naturally heal over time and cast, and there was a potential that the arm could grow, uh, could heal crooked. The second option was to have a surgery repairing the fracture with plate and screws. Then another man in what seemed to be a police uniform underneath uh, the pr protective uh, gear entered the room. 
He asked if uh, Caitlin was my girlfriend. I said, yes. He explained that they uh, caught her trying to sneak in the hospital through a back door and that they weren't going to press any kind of charges this time. But I had to call and tell her that she had to go home and they wouldn't be so forgiving the next time. I remember thinking to myself, that's my girl. The orthopedic surgeon, he then continued to explain that the surgery would fix my humerus fractures immediately, and I would only have to heal from the procedure. He also explained that if I went with the cast, there is no risk of infection from the surgery, but my arm could, you know, could take a lot longer, and it could also be crooked. At that time, I told him I wanted to go with the, with the old school and have a cast put on. At this time, at my point in life, I've never had a cast or any broken uh, bone in my body other than maybe a, like a toe or a, or a little finger. He then addressed my broken sacrum. At this time, I really didn't even know what or where the sacrum was or what it did. He explained that it's at the bottom of my spinal cord and that most of your nerves end at the spinal cord and then go through your sacrum. It was fortunate that it was fractured on both sides and not deformed because the sacrum is unlike any other bone in your body, and it never completely heals. He explained to me that the fractures uh, pretty much get little spot welds that go across it, and that the fractures remain. He then told me about my 13 broken ribs. Again, it was difficult to understand what they were saying, because their face masks underneath their hoods um, were fogging up, and it was just difficult to hear them. I also was difficult to see because I had given myself a black eye. During the impact, when I was on the control so hard, when I shattered my, my right arm, my hand had come up and, and struck myself in the face. The nurse um, came in and told me that they wanted me to drink some water and eat lunch and that they would return to check on me. The food was already in my room and she notified me that due to being in quarantine, that they wouldn't be back for a couple hours. And Caitlin, who was waiting to see me, would have to wait a minimum of five days to get current on COVID vaccinations. She only advised me to eat and rest. I had to make that difficult call to my girlfriend, Caitlin, and tell her it's best to go home until quarantine was up. She reluctantly went back home to our studio on the Big Island. Alone in my room, not being able to sit up and move, my mind kept wandering about my passengers on board. This began to put me in a dark place. I was alone, unable to sit up or use my right arm. Um, I'm right-handed, so, you know, even eating and everything was difficult. Um, you know, being able not to sit up, I had to kind of push food in my mouth and try not to choke even drinking. If I did sit up more than 10 to 15 degrees, um, I got into some pretty intense pain that was uh, pretty much from my chest down to my, my ankles. Drinking through a straw was hard. Again, it was almost, you know, it, it wanted to come back up. It felt like I was going to choke. I had survived a helicopter crash and felt like I was going to choke on the food in the hospital. Again, I was in the room alone and had nobody there to help me. The next day, my ortho doctor came in to talk to me about putting my arm in the cast. At this time, I asked the doctor more about the surgery he had um, given me in as an option to put the plate in my arm. He explained it to me in detail, and I changed my mind and elected to have the surgery. He scheduled it for the next morning. That was my third day in the ICU, and that would be four days after the accident. I asked many times to that doctor and the nurses how my passengers were, only to be told to worry about my injuries and to, just to heal. Again, I was left alone without my phone, so I had limited contact to the outside world. My girlfriend and coworkers could call on the landline, but they did not know the status of my passengers. Again, this was hard and put me in a very hard and dark time for me. My mind was wondering what had happened to my passengers, and I really felt that one or many of them had potentially died. On the third day in the ICU, I had the surgery, and it went well. When I came to in the recovery room, I grabbed the ICU nurse, scrub, and I pulled her closer to me, and I asked her to tell me what happened to my passengers. She looked me in my eyes and said that they had all survived. 
not believing her, I pulled her closer and I said, don't fuck with me because I'm here. And she looked at me with a very intense and very uh, con uh, convincing uh, face. And she said, they all survived. She says, we don't lie to you here in the ICU. This was the best feeling ever. We had all survived. Moving on into the recovery, the days following my surgery, repairing my right arm became lighter compared to the previous dark days after knowing that everyone had survived. Caitlin returned to Oahu and Paradise Helicopters provided me a cell phone with free program numbers in it. Later, my cell phone was found intact by some of the accident investigators and it was returned to me. Being isolated wasn't so terrible when I could talk with loved ones and friends. And boy, oh boy, did I get lots of calls and lots of texts. This became my lifeline to the outside world and my first insight to what had happened to the helicopter. A fellow devil dog and coworker who was the first on scene had relayed that the tail boom was not attached and located more than a football field away from the main fuselage. In his text message, he said, I was no longer a pilot, but I was a test pilot. He said he had never understood how we got to the ground uh, without a tail boom and everybody survived. Up until that day, I had no idea what had actually failed. On the fifth day of COVID quarantine, Caitlin flew back to Oahu on the earliest flight. She caught a ride to the hospital and she checked in with the front desk at the, at the hospital. They checked her vaccination and okayed her to come up to visit me in the ICU. At that time, I was talking with my two doctors, the neurosurgeon and my orthopedic doctor and a nurse. When she arrived, it was so good to see and feel her kisses. And finally, we could touch. We cried a lot. The doctor, the doctors uh, had paused to give Caitlin and I some time to rekindle. Before the doctors resumed my examination, another nurse came into the room. She identified herself as the head nurse in charge at the time. Keep in mind, all the doctors and nurses uh, were in full PPE gear, those hoods and full covered over along with their mask inside and gloves. Um, she began to tell me that Caitlin would have to leave immediately because I was still in COVID quarantine. Caitlin explained to her that she had followed the directions given to her by the hospital staff but the head nurse was not budging on her stance. With all my strength, I looked at my doctors and said, if she goes, I go. You can roll me uh, down to the front doors. It was unbelievable to me that the staff could be this cruel. I pleaded with the two doctors um, and everyone there to uh, keep Caitlin and tell her that I could stay there. They all left the room except for Caitlin for a few minutes. And the two doctors came back and said that she could stay. What an emotional ride those few minutes were. For three weeks, I was in the ICU, unable to sit or stand. I could only have one visitor per day. My son, Tim, had flown up from uh, Florida earlier. So Caitlin and Tim would alternate days visiting with me. They weren't able to come in and leave and another visitor come in. You were only allowed one visitor on that day. Paradise helicopters were kind enough to fly my son out, and they also put Caitlin and my son up in Oahu. I'm really uh, thankful for what Paradise did to uh, get my family uh, and have them there with me the whole time I was in the hospital. Almost seven weeks, they uh, took care of Caitlin and my son. I had excruciating pain in my lower back and legs if I bent more than 10 to 15 degrees. Eating and drinking was still difficult after almost two weeks in the ICU. It's hard to describe not being able to crap on your own and to have someone clean up for you, but the staff were truly professionals and never made me uncomfortable. My biggest hurdle to get out of the hospital and into rehab was not being able to sit or stand. The hospital required that I had x-rays standing up and the rehab facility also required that I would be able to sit and stand for a brief time before I could be transferred. The next week during physical therapy, while I was still in the ICU, while trying to sit up, my son was there and he asked the physical therapist, can we just skip the painful sitting and try to lift my dad up on his feet? 
the physical therapist, both and him agreed. And on my next attempt from laying down, instead of us uh, sitting up, um, we went right to uh, me standing up. They both helped lifting me from my shoulders. And this was the first time in almost four weeks that I was standing on my two feet, <laughs> albeit with both of them holding on to me. I was standing for the first time in almost a month and looking me eye to eye with my son. The next few days were hard, but I had to get out of the hospital and into rehab. Caitlin and Tim with the staff pushed me harder. And at the end of my ICU stay, I finally could uh, do my x-ray and I got admitted into the uh, Pacific of the rehab on Oahu. The transport from Oahu ICU to uh, Pacific rehab was short, about 15 minutes in a medical van, but it was my first breath of fresh air and my first uh, time that I had sunshine on my face in almost four and a half weeks. I was in rehab for another three weeks. I learned to walk and take care of myself before getting discharged. It was a painful flight back home to the Big Island, but Caitlin, she was my rock supporting me all the time. My son uh, went home from Oahu back to Florida. Upon arrival back in Kona, Paradise Helicopters greeted us when we arrived with lots of love and aloha. It was very emotional seeing my friends and coworkers that had called and supported me so very much through this ordeal. I don't want to linger on the subject too much, but workers' compensation is nothing like getting any health care from a normal provider. It's much, much more difficult and hard to get appropriate, timely care. It takes weeks and months to get anything that's normally approved in a day with normal health care. I can go over anything you might want to know about my ongoing experience with workers' comp later, um, person to person, if anyone wants to talk more about this. I'd rather like to keep this uh, moving forward and positive and talking about my miraculous recovery over the next year and a half till today. Not long after getting home, I was experiencing lots of new and different pains. I had been fighting the control so hard that when we impacted the lava rock, that it shattered my right arm and humerus that was controlling the cyclic. This was found to have detached blood vessels that were in my bones and my wrist. After demanding workers' comp for MRIs and waiting almost two months to get a specialist to see my, my right hand um, imagery, we had found out that the bones that were in my wrist had died from lack of blood flow and that later in November, they were surgically removed, leaving me with a 50% range of motion to my right hand, which is my dominant hand. Not long after Christmas, my left hand started having pain and cramping. The left finger and my palm hard tissue began building up, preventing me from straightening out my uh, pinky and my finger next to it, the number four and five finger, fingers over the next several months. My right hip and legs uh, began to crunch and pop, progressively more and more over time and more pain. Once I finally got to see a workers' comp surgeon, he explained that I was bone on bone in my right hip and that it needed a total hip replacement soon. Throughout the following months, I continued with physical therapy three times a week. That was pretty much for my, my lower back and my, and my legs and occupational therapy twice a week for my uh, right arm and my right hand. Um, following workers' comp direction. This wasn't helping much, and in the following of December of 2023, I had reconstructive surgery on my left hand and fingers, and five days later, I had a total hip replacement for the right side. My son came out from Florida again to help take care of me after the surgeries. It was nice to have Caitlin and my son all together for the holidays, even though I was a mess from recovering from two back-to-back -back surgeries. This is when Kate and I started telling our friends and family a little later that we were expecting our newest uh, family member, a baby girl in June. I hope 2024 is the year I get to recover enough and get to get released from workers' comp and potentially get my medical renewed and back to flying. Paradise Helicopters has been supportive and key to my well being more than I can express to you. Mahalo, Paradise. I get to be a father again this summer with the love of my life. We are an expanding family that does not give up. I want to say to everyone, never give up. Stay true to your calling. 
use your weird strengths. I call it my spidey senses. And love yourself and loved ones like there isn't a tomorrow. Never give up. And thank you for hearing my story. Uh, Tim, I don't even know how to start on something like this. Wow. And obviously we're finishing with a uh, picture of your your daughter, your future daughter here. Um, yeah. And congratulations. So I'm going to stop sharing, uh, just bring the two of us in. Um, so now is, to the people watching now is the time to bring your questions in. Um, so I'll go ahead and get things started. Um, Tim, an, an incident like this obviously is incredibly rare. Um, first of all, let's talk, what, what kind of input did you get or um, what did the investigators tell you uh, based on uh, what they were learning about the accident? Uh, I, I know the at the safety symposium at Heli Expo, uh, the NTSB actually was there. Uh, one of their uh, board members was there and uh, addressed the investigation. What yeah. what can you say that uh, about the investigation? Well, well, the first thing I'd like to say about the investigation and the NTSB is that they are extremely professional. And they added a very human touch to the investigation to me being a, a key portal. Uh, it was the, the, the my best knowledge of about finding out about my passengers. But uh, shortly after the accident, you know, I was contacted by the uh, the accident team uh, from the NTSB. And, you know, they had basically explained to me that the tail boom had separated in flight and that they were uh, missing the upper left bolt that holds the left launcher on and the, from the fuselage to the uh, tail boom. That being the most critical uh, bolt out of the four bolts that hold the 407 tail boom together, they said it was likely that after that release, that bolt separated, um, that the other ones, you know, could not take the, the load and that they they got ripped off. Um, so that's when, uh, you know, I started seeing some pictures that they had taken from the uh, accident scene, uh, the area out there. Um, they were quick to note that the very first day at the accident site. Um, one of the investigators, uh, within a few feet of landing in the chopper that dropped him off near there, um, had fallen and and cut his face up pretty good and arms and legs. It's just it's hard to describe the the area where uh, the accident where we uh, crashed at. But fortunately, um, I, I I don't know how you know I got we got so fortunate was the area where the where we impacted was flat ish um you know that that lava sharp jagged stuff is like saw blades like circular saw blades pointing up in all directions where we impacted there wasn't much of that it was pretty flat and that we hit and so we didn't just you know suffer injuries from the lava um and you know also puncturing any of the fuel tanks or anything like that and probably within six miles is that flat spot was the only place where uh, we could have landed, and about 300 feet from there was another flat-ish spot where they could land a rescue chopper where they flew us over to the ambulance and stuff, and that's where the accident investigators had to come in at. Um, but they, you know, they, they they just begin to tell me that, you know, that that uh, that bolt was missing. They never found that bolt, and that, you know, they had believed that the tail boom fractured in flight. Um, at that point, they, you know, they didn't think it was any of of my doing or anything that you know happened but that was my first insight to you know that the tail boom separated in flight at about 1700 feet again about 120 knots obviously when you're going through flight school you practice auto rotations you practice what happens if you you know what happens if x y or z happens in flight Nothing can really prepare you for something like this. Uh, was there any kind of element in your uh, training or your background that helped you uh, during this situation? Oh. Well, Dan and, and everybody watching, it's just so every single thing in my life led up to this, you know, you know, being growing up on the ocean in, in South Florida, you know, being a boat captain, transitioning into being, a, you know, a helicopter pilot. I've learned to trust my 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 instincts, what I call my spidey senses in that. And, you know, just I've always been that that, you know, student, you know, through flight training that asked the question a whole lot more, 
always wanted it to understand, you know, to, to my liking and, and, and that, and, you know, just have always throughout my career, I've always asked for more training or asked for, you know, more emergency procedures. And, and, and so, yes, all of that has come into play is just, um, you know, again, um, when, when it happened, it was more of a reaction to me to, uh, you know, try to get the machine straight and level, which, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly to what, you know, avail that happened, but, you know, my training and instinct came into that. I knew something in the back had gone wrong. My, both my pedals were, were useless and I was fighting the controls very hard, just trying to get right side up. Um, you know, according to the investigation, some of the information from the, from the engine control system, the fade act, um, when the tail boom separated, we, uh, lost our weight and balance, of course. So we nosed over, over 860 degrees at the same time while we were yawing to the right. So in those couple of seconds before we impacted, you know, that's why I could not see any, I was seeing red and blue, you know, it was just up and down while we were spinning. So it was, I, I don't even know, I can't even imagine how it was doing, but you know, my instincts was to make a mayday call, um, was to tell my passengers to brace and somewhere in that thing, you know, I, you know, my, my mind and my body, rolled that throttle off, you know, instinct and training came into play. And, and I can't emphasize how much that, you know, that is, you know, the biggest part of probably why we're all alive today that was on board that machine is just from, you know, not taking, you know, training lightly and just, you know, whatever level you have to get to, to get to that, to have that confidence. I really, you know, suggest that any pilot, any student, you know, always, you know, hold yourself to a higher standard and, and just make sure that you're confident in the platform that you're flying. Okay, so just to back up for a second, not only when you lost the tail boom, you started spinning on one axis, but because the weight and balance, you were also spinning multiple directions at the same time. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, it is. And, and even one of the passengers on back, um, you know, in their in their NTSB report, they they you know they in their in their statement they said that we were going end over end, and it's. It, you know, the, the way it, it's, it was terrible how it, how it was, but at, at the same time, we were being pushed forward, you know, from the end over and then the yawing was pushing us. It was just, it, you know, I, I had no idea of our attitude. You know, I could not focus inside. I was just trying to look outside and I was just in my head trying to get straight and level. That was, I was hoping to see more blue than red. I just didn't know where we were doing it, but I did know that we were descending rapidly. You, you talked about how the passengers were able to extract themselves from the aircraft, that you were the last one in. Um, they helped you get out. They were uh, also making calls for assistance. Have you maintained contact with the passengers at all? Um, so up until not that long ago, I, I have not had any direct contact with the passengers. All, all I've had up in for probably the first year was the NTSB and um, what they knew about them from their, their survival analysis, talking to them and their investigators talking to them. And then also, you know, paradise is, uh, um, dealing with them. So my, my company, the NTSB were my, were my only portal to, to know anything about them. Um, I've had a lot of friends, uh, reach out to me, you know, and, and even, you know, some of my close friends have, have wanted to know if I wanted them to act on my behalf, to reach out to the, to the passengers on board and, and, you know, out of respect for them, um, I, I do believe that they have my contact info and know how to get a hold of me. Um, but again, for that respect for them, I don't want them to ever have to think about that that time of their life ever again unless they want to. So I know talking to me, any part of that could trigger anything for them and, and all that. So out of respect for them, I have not reached out to them at all. And I just I just all I know is that the four people in the back um were, were injured, you know, not, not that much. And we're out of the hospital the next day, but the, the young girl up in front of me got injured, you know, pretty seriously. And, and from what I understand, um, those two girls, they were twins. They're in college now and are living the best lives that they can, you know, less the traumatic event that, that, that occurred to us. Your recovery is, is ongoing. Um, what are your plans to get back into the cockpit? Um, well, I, I hope to uh, continue on with my dream of, of, you know, flying back here in Hawaii and, and potentially, you know, Caitlin, um, now that we've 
shift a little bit into uh, family mode. You know, we were kind of wait till flight training was done for her um, prior to this accident. So we've kind of changed that. And um, I have to um, get my medical back, which I'm hoping to do here in the next couple of months. Um, I let it expire this past May. Um, I'm dealing with the NTSB and the uh, and also the FAA kind of getting all my medical records and, and everything about the accident to them. Luckily, you know, I had no loss of consciousness or, or head injuries other than giving myself the black eye when I kind of knocked myself uh, up on there. So it, it should be pretty straightforward, but, I, you know, I am still on some uh, medications that are disqualifiers. And so I have to deal with getting them out um, of my, you know, off my prescription list before I can even consider reaching back out to the FAA and the, uh, the AME to get my medical back. But um, through Heli Expo and, and, and my exposure there, I got to meet quite a few people and so many people reached out to me with resources. Uh, a lot of folks in the EMS community, uh, their safety officers, uh, you know, met with me after a safety symposium and offered to bring me to their facilities and put me through a, a SIM course and that with their, with their, um, you know, pretty high tech SIMs, which, you know, I, I would be very interested in, in kind of simulate, I don't know how you simulate a tail boom separating in a simulator, but you know, we could do some tail rotor failures and stuck pedals and, and whatnot. And I just need to know that I have that confidence that I had prior to the accident going back into being a commercial pilot, you know, or flying anybody or any kind of mission around. Um, I hope to get that back, but, um, you know, again, I, you know, I owe it to, you know, to the community, the aviation community, to any body that I potentially could fly to have that confidence again before taking on any commercial pilot duties. Um, I do hope to fly. I don't, I don't think I can fly another 14, you know, a utility 14 on and 14 off shift. I don't think I could do 14 days, eight hours on ever again with my, with my back, you know, my, my surgeons and my medical team, when I left the hospital, they basically said that on June 8th, that my body aged 25 years, especially my, my back and my skeletal system. So even though, you know, I'm, I'm 54 years old now, you know, I have the body of a 79 year old, um, you know, you know, you know, grandma made to play tennis when she was in her twenties, but you know, when grandma's playing tennis at her 79, you know, even if she's in good health, she can't do what she used to do. And, and that's a good just analogy that I kind of been given is, you know, that I've got the body of a 79 year old now. I can no longer do any kind of impact uh, activities, no running. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I was roping and, and, and trying to be, you know, somewhat of a cowboy, you know, and stuff that I could in that, you know, and I'll never be able to get back to that or be able to ride a horse or, or anything other than, a, you know, a slow walk or that. So lots of my things have changed, but you know, I, I believe I'm right now at the best that I will be for the rest of my life. And so I have just got to learn how, how to adapt to that, to uh, get back into flying. Paradise Helicopters, uh, where I'm at now, they've afforded me back the safety officer position um, until I can get back into flying and if I get back into flying. And they've assured me that if I can fly one flight a week and be safety officer, I can do that. If I can fly five days a week and become back a, you know, a line officer, a line pilot, that I can do that. So they, they've made me feel very comfortable that no matter what, um, that I have a place here and that this is my family and that they support me and Caitlin and, and that, you know, I, I hope to get back to flying as much as I can with Paradise as soon as I can. Well, that's good to hear. I mean, uh, it's nice that they, I, I hate to make a joke like this, but it's nice that they've got your back even uh, after broken vertebrae. <laughs> yeah. um, hey, uh, we, we, we saw at least one picture of um, of your dog and uh, your service dog. Yeah. Tell me. So Atlas, is, Atlas, Caitlin and I, we adopted Atlas uh, this past May uh, 20, 20 or the 20th. So this coming up May uh, will be one year we've had them. Um, I'm a disabled veteran. I got, I got, I got hurt a little bit back when I was in the Marine Corps when I was pretty young. And I, I've had a service dog back then. I was 21 years old and have a service dog then. Hadn't required one for quite some time, but uh, after this accident, you know, it's talking with my my doctors and my and medical, and it just not what it was a good idea to get. Um, you know, it takes about two years to get a service dog trained up, and I don't require one all the time right now. But he does help me go up hills, steps, and all that stuff when needed. And it also gives me some time to, uh, you know, we helped the island. We, we rescued Atlas from the Humane Society. So we, we, we chose a dog and whatnot. And he's become, uh, you know, a new member of, the, of Caitlin and I's family, you know, and, and we're really anxious for, for our daughter to meet him and stuff. But, 
he gets to come to work with us and stuff and he's trained he's been on a couple flights uh inner island with us uh you know through the commercial flight system and that so running him through the airports of tsa has been he's been an amazing dog and an amazing addition to our to our family just a, a great um I don't want to call him a tool, but he's, he is also going to be a service animal and a great tool for me to come in the future. Um, go back to uh, Heli Expo just a minute. Um, I know you said that um, you've got some great offers from some of the safety people there. Um, also, I'm hearing that uh, you uh, got to connect with the, the the Bristol pilots who earned the Matthews Zaccaro Land and Live Award. Oh. Um, obviously, their situation is a little bit different, but it sounds like you really have started to expand your your network within a, a unique group of people um, who've yeah. experienced odd situations in flight. Well, you know that uh, you know the the Monday the, the safety symposium was the day before the floor opened up at Heli Expo, so you know I, I kind of felt like I was like opening and like the headline for for the Heli Expo and that, and then I got to tell my story and. Just a tremendous feedback afterwards, uh, um, you know, meeting, um, you know, a couple of flight paramedics that were at my symposium that we connected really well that, um, you know, got injured on uh, on the job and that. And also, you know, just a great on top of that. So, you know, I, I, naturally, I, I my, my ego and my head got pretty big. And then that 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 Monday night, we went to the presidential uh, dinner and uh, the first story up was those Bristow pilots. And I got to sit back and I got to hear their story and see some of the video and the animation and stuff. And I'm like, holy crap, I just, I, I can't believe, you know, I mean, I, you know, it put my, it made my head shrink and my ego go back down. Cause I was like, what a dynamic team those two guys were. And, and I couldn't even imagine, you know, that, you know, what was going through their heads and, and to, you know, to safely land and, and barely damage a machine under the conditions that they were on. And, and the amount of teamwork that they did was, was amazing. And then I got to meet the pilot of the year uh, and, you know, and, and heard his whole story from his background of flying, you know, as a warrant officer and, and missions that he did in combat. And then, you know, to be in a, you know, an L.A., uh, a, you know, pilot and stuff was just just such a great, great thing. Um, you know, and, and thanks for bringing up, you know, the whole HAI, BAI part of it. Um, I want to put a really shout out to uh, Chris Hill, who really did above and beyond anything that I could ever imagine to make a uh, heli expo and my safety symposium. Fantastic for, for Caitlin and me and for our family and for our friends that attended there. Um, Chris, Hill, if you're watching or if not, if you see this always, always a mahalo. And I, I, I always look forward to any conversations at our next meetings and that, and a big thank out to HAI and, and VAI now. Uh, for those who are not aware, Chris Hill is our senior director of safety here at uh, vertical aviation international and uh, was instrumental in uh, getting Tim connected. Hi, Caitlin, and hi, Atlas. <laughs> nice to see you guys. Um, yeah. No, I'm glad that uh, that all worked out. And Chris uh, is uh, helping me with, with some of the questions. He's uh, joined us here on the, the backside of the webinar. Um, Tim, you know, before we got started, uh, we talked a little bit about the fact that there are student pilots who have registered to attend today. Um, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out? Not, you know, with any expectation that something like this will ever happen in their career. What was the best advice you could give to somebody who's a new pilot? Well, you know, if it's your passion to fly and it's a passion to fly helicopters, you know, I mean, I, I can't say enough. It is my, you know, it, it's been my, my passion, you know, up to us some here and how, you know, the, all the hurdles that you got to go through to be a student pilot, you know, just the, the logistics of it all, you know, going to a flight school, most people have to relocate to go to a flight school. Um, you're doing so many things, you know, learning, you know, the, you know, the airspace and learning, you know, just communicating on the, on the fair. And my biggest thing is, is just never give up. Um, you're going to be co constantly throwing hurdles at you. And at that early stage as a student pilot from, you know, being a, you know, that first intro flight to getting your private rating and, and a, everything above that, there's always going to be those hurdles and how you deal with those hurdles, whether it be finances, um, you know, family, relocating, any of that, just hone in those skills and, and, and all that. And that will determine that kind of pilot that you're going to be because, you know, to be, you know, quite honest, you know, as, as a commercial pilot, every day we're given a, sh a, a shit sandwich and we have to make it taste good. <laughs> um, you know, not always do things go accordingly, you know, from the extreme to, you know, uh, an emergency situation that 
that you can uh, come up to, um, to just a, an everyday normal, you know, as in flight training, having a great day, you know, as passing your first check ride, your private check ride is, is a huge uh, endeavor and that, and it just makes you feel good. Take every single one of those things uh, incredibly serious and just put 110% into it when possible and, and have the best uh, um, Ohana, your family and, and your friends around, you know, that's, that was a key to my going through, you know, I had my, my son a lot through flight training, helped me and all the other student pilots that were about, you know, just a couple weeks or a couple behind wherever you're at in that training you know, going over the ground with them and just understanding stuff and right down to your instructors. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have some pretty good instructors and, and some that were, I don't want to say bad instructors, but we just didn't connect right. So a big thing to you student guys out there and everybody looking to, to move forward is make sure you get that connection with your instructor and stuff. And don't be afraid to say, hey, can I just fly with somebody else? You might fly with somebody else and, and not have the connection you have with that first person, but it's good to have that contrast and those options to know that, hey, you know, maybe this person teaches me ground better and I fly better with this person, or you may just click better with an instructor. So, you know, I just, you know, really take every uh, opportunity that you got and try it. And if it doesn't work, you know, use it in your wheelhouse and, and, and go back to that instructor or ask for another instructor and uh, just be true into that. You know, really, you know, even if you pass a maneuver through school or pass something, if you don't feel that you've learned it enough, you know, take that extra step like I did in my, a lot of my flight training, you know, I, if any of my instructors are on here, they can probably remember. I was probably that student who was just like, you know, they were like, when we're doing autos, they're like, why do you want to go over here? I'm like, well, this is why I want to go over here. You know, I, I want to land near water or something. I want you know, you know, or a road or something. You know, I just always stuck true to what my instincts was saying. And I also listened to my instructors and, and took into what the core was on that, but I adapted it into my flight training and into my flight characteristics. Um, I, I guess I've got one final question for you, Tim, and I don't know if you want to uh, uh, ask Caitlin to join you on this, but um, I'd like to know, do you guys have a name for your daughter yet? Oh, well, <laughs> she's over here right now. We, 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 we bounced around a lot of names and, you know, the first couple, uh, the first trimester, you know, we, we did a lot of writing it down on a, on a, board and wiping them down and keeping a couple and and i think what we're going to do is uh we're going to wait till uh she's she's here with us and you know and give her a couple days to kind of get a feeling of what she is but um you know what we've come up a couple couple names but here in hawaii um kovela is how you say summer in hawaiian and she's going to be born in june so we're that's we're kind of thinking kovela is going to be part of her name but again we, we're not going to give her any any name until she's born that and that, uh, but I, I would like to have some of her family, possibly, you know, and some of our friends all kind of come together. And it's kind of a Hawaiian tradition that I'm learning a little bit more that friends or close family will help you name your uh, child. And that so we we really like uh, all our friends and family to be part of that. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, Tim, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story. Um, I know you shared it uh, with Expo. You shared it uh, with us today. I. I I'm grateful the fact that you're continuing to tell your story to help others. Um, again, I, I know a situation like this is really rare, but as you say, anything that you can add to your wheelhouse, you know, making yourself aware of your, you know, paying more attention to your spidey senses is yeah. bound to help uh, pilots. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, you know, I, I, you know, I ended my safety symposium at HAI, you know, and that, and it just, always never give up, you know, again, you know, to, to students, to commercial pilots, to ATP or in any, just anybody that's in aviation or whatever you do, just don't give up. You know, that's the whole part. Don't ever give up. If it's what you know is right and what you think is right and your instincts are saying, do not give up, you know? Well, and it's, it's from things like this where you, you're just, your life experiences build so far upon each mm -hmm. other and that creates that sense for you. So, no, it, it's fantastic to hear your story and uh, can't wait to hear when you're back in the air again. Yeah, me too. And, and again, uh, everybody uh, from HAI and, and VAI and, and Dan, uh, thank you for uh, asking me to uh, be on this webinar, this and that. It's, this is my first webinar for anybody. So you guys got to cut to see my first and I, and I hope I did all right for everybody out there. And, and I don't know quite how sure it'll work out, but you're more than welcome to reach me. You know, I'm at, 
tim.hunter at paradisehelicopters.com. You can uh, reach out to me uh, via email that, and, and we can move forward from there. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions or, or to discuss anything with anybody that would like to. Uh, this has been, a, you know, obviously a life-changing uh, event for me and Caitlin and, and also Paradise Helicopters as we're evolving into um, trying to be, a, you know, a, just a better company out here and, and do everything we can, you know, right down to the ground crew and things to be safety, you know. Safety is number one and always, you know, get home and, and get home to your loved ones and, and, and bring everybody home that's on your flights. That's incredibly gracious of you and of Paradise Helicopters. Uh, my my gratitude to you, to Caitlin, and to everybody at Paradise. Yeah. 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 And again, a big shout out to all my friends and everybody that supported me through this and are supporting me now. I couldn't have done it without everybody. And there was people I didn't even know who reached out to me when I was in the hospital. And let me tell you, those were some really dark days, those first couple of weeks in the hospital. And if it wasn't for my phone all the time going with a text message or a voicemail or somebody calling me, thank you again, really, really for everything everybody's done to to help me uh, get past this and move forward in that. And again, a really big shout out, mahalo for my friends and family. You guys know who you are and, and I love you guys. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Tim. I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen again. I've got a few things to uh, just uh, housekeeping things to wrap up, uh, things that are Coming up, um, whoops, I think I shared the wrong screen here. Need to uh, just do a few housekeeping things and talk about what's coming up uh, here in the future. Uh, and uh, yep. just wrap things up. So i uh, be back with you. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, our webinars we do are, are now on a monthly schedule. We hold them the first, excuse me, the second Thursday of every month at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the recordings will always be available for you to watch whenever you like. Upcoming webinars we have um, on April 11th, uh, Enhancing Artificial Intelligence with uh, in Aircraft Operations. And that's with a, uh, a professor at Georgia Tech University who's working with advanced, uh, excuse me, artificial intelligence. And I think that that one's going to be really interesting. And uh, the one in May, we are going to have a presentation from uh, John Piasecki, who is the son of the Piasecki Foundation, or fa excuse me, Piasecki family. And they're working on a hydrogen powered aircraft that uh, seems like it could be, uh, has some great potential. So looking forward to that. Um, if you want more information, um, Coincidentally, the current issue of Rotor Magazine uh, just came out uh, during Heli Expo. The focus of that issue is a more in-depth story on uh, Tim's situation. I, I, I can't call it an accident because I don't think that's fair to the situation. It's a, it's an incident that's unlike many that I've heard about before. Um, Rotor Magazine is an award-winning publication. It and Rotor Daily uh, will be going under undergoing name changes as well as Vertical Aviation International. Uh, continues its evolution uh, to involve more of our uh, aircraft in our airspace. Uh, Rotor Daily is a daily news uh, aggregator that we go through Google, we go through the FAA, we go through EASA, we go through all the different news sources to find information about the industry that we feel is worth sharing with you. You can subscribe to both of them uh, very simply, rotor.org currently slash subscribe. Uh, there's no charge for either one. Rotor Magazine, if you're international, there is a small stipend charge for international mailing. Uh, but it's a, it's a great quarterly publication that really gets more in-depth into the things like uh, Tim's situation. So we also, since we're a membership-based organization, we always want to know what we can do better. It's, it's a really important to us to find out uh, what you think we could be doing better, what we could do differently, or if we're doing things right the, the right way. Please let us know. Best way to do that at right now is to use uh, our president's email address, president at rotor.org. Jim Viola does see each email. He does uh, respond. He does uh, forward them to some of the staff for uh, additional work. And so we always uh, pay attention to those informa that information. That does wrap up our webinar for today. We appreciate that you took time out of your schedule to listen to Tim's story. It's fascinating. We are grateful that he was able to join us today. Uh, until uh, April, we look forward to uh, seeing you again real soon. We ask that you fly safe and that you be safe.